Hello and welcome to this Adobe Illustrator Crash Course Tutorial. In this particular video here, we're going to walk through the Adobe Illustrator step-by-step -step so you can get an understanding of how the Adobe Illustrator program works. So we're going to walk through some of the basic fundamentals. We're going to walk through various examples. Uh, we're going to walk through the various tools. And then we're going to have some example exercises that you can walk through and be able to work on yourself as we're actually going through the video. Uh, we're going to walk through various logos. So let's go ahead and walk through the different lessons that we're going to cover in this particular video. So this crash course is broken down into two sections. It's going to be the section number one here where we're going to be covering our boards, uh, navigating Illustrator, what do all the buttons do, how do the settings work, uh, how to work with different projects, right? And then we're going to walk through vectors. And then we're going to walk through the Adobe Illustrator user interface, right? We want you to be able to get an understanding of how it all works, uh, where all the buttons are located, uh, how to do uh, different things that allow you to save things easily, uh, how to expand, right? How to reduce size. Uh, then we're going to walk through the properties panel. Uh, and then we're going to walk through the Adobe Illustrator settings. And then in section two, this is where the magic starts to happen here, where we start getting into the various shapes, uh, different transformations. Uh, we're going to walk through combining shapes. So we have three different logos that we're going to create from scratch. And we're going to walk you step by step exactly how to do that. So we're going to walk through the Mitsubishi logo, the Skype logo, and then finally the Google logo. So you'll be able to see exactly how we do this and then be able to walk through step by step over the shoulder and create the logos yourself. And then we're going to walk through organizing objects. And then finally, we'll cover uh, the various drawing tools. So I'm excited for you to get started and let's jump right in. Now, in this video, we'll be talking about um, art, art boards just to understand them a little more in Illustrator. So art boards are the pages in Illustrator. The way you have um, pages in your regular Word document, you have art boards in Illustrator. And they are basically used to be able to um, organize your content and um, just give you different elements um, in different um, in different locations. So as you can see here, let me zoom out a little. I'll just I'll just um, zoom out. Okay, so you can see here I have three art boards, which is which is one, two, and three here. Um, if I was let me zoom back in a little. If I you can see, if you look down here, you can see one is selected, which is which is um which is which is telling you that I'm viewing my first art board when I click my arrow it goes to the second one so it has put this in focus uh, next um, and the third one so I can just zoom out a little more so they can see everything so art boards are the pages in Illustrator and they're very easy to maneuver they're very easy to um, to use you you use the art board tool which is down here so I'm just gonna drag this a little okay so here's the art board tool so they use this to manage your artboard. So things you can do, you can duplicate an artboard. So let me, I hold down my options button on my mark keyboard. And then as I drag, you can see here, it's duplicating the artboard. It has made it, and it has made another artboard there. Uh, one other thing you'll notice here is um, at, the, at the top left hand corner of every artboard, you'll see a number and then um, a, a name technically yeah the name so the number is what illustrator uses to identify the order of the artboard so it makes sense this is zero, this is one two three and four the name is what um, you are allowed to um, edit so you can't edit the number you can edit the name so here i have this artboard named wine so let's say i change that um let's assume i can change that back to red for example enter so you can see the artboard is now named zero one dash red and this is 02 yellow, this is 03 blue outline, and this is 04 blue outline copy because I just made a copy of that out of that artboard just now. So this is important because you need to be able to keep a track of the number of your artboards and then what order they come in. You could have up to a thousand artboards in a single Adobe Illustrator document. So it's very important to be able to uh, organize them properly. 
now um, one thing I can do is I can click this here I can rearrange my artboards the way I want them to so let's say just for presentation purposes I wanted to bring this here so here's what you'll notice is this if you look at the top left hand corner zero one red zero three blue outline so you can see here that Illustrator is not identifying these artboards based on their visual arrangement but instead based on their chronological arrangement how they appeared in the document so this is still the second artboard if I however wanted to re um, if, I, if I wanted to re um, put it in a different position I come here to the artboard panel so when I click there artboard panel you can see here as far as Illustrator is concerned my first artboard is the red my second is the yellow, third is the blue outline, and the fourth is blue outline copy. So if I wanted to rearrange it to match what I'm visually seeing here, I hold on yellow and drag it down to the bottom. So when I do that, it has now become 04 yellow as you can see. Now um, this is important when you're trying to export. So we're going to attempt an export right now. So for to export, I go file. Um, and then export, export for screen. So export is when you're done, you're done with the work on your artboard and you want to take them out, take the, take out the vector graphics, you want to take out the PNGs, you want to take out the JPEGs and, um, and, and uh, for, for presentation purposes. So you can see here, I have my artboard selected. You can see I have three of them highlighted and that's why there's a range here, one comma three to four. That's because the second artboard is missing however if I added it to the list you can see it just says one to four here so let's say I was only interested in uh, for example let's say only the last artboard which is my yellow as you can see here so you can see four yellow is selected here so let's say I wanted to have it as a JPEG for example JPEG 100 that's talking about the um, the quality level of the of the JPEG and then I export artboard so when I do that, it's going to export it here, and I'm just going to hit, it's going, this is, this is right here, yellow 100 JPEG. I'd done some previous exports on this, so that's why you can see all these ones here. But then if I double click it to open up, and then you can see this is my artboard that has been exported. So you can see why the, the arrangement is important. You, you you can sometimes you may not be able to um, rely on the visual arrangement but then you should know that these numbers are very important so let's say I wanted to rearrange my artboard and just make them a little more um, orderly I can just come here artboard options so sorry rearrange all so you can see it it gives it can give me a, lay, a particular layout I can either lay out um, first by row, doing a grid by row, or a grid by column. So I just select the first one here, which is grid by row. So let's say I want to have two columns. So when I do that, I'm going to have one artboard, second artboard, then the third artboard is going to come underneath the first artboard, and then it's going to keep arranging it like that, no matter how many artboards I have. So when I click OK, you can see it has rearranged my entire artboard in a grid format so let's say i wanted to try another format which is rearranged by column so what that does is in this in this scenario i have one two three and four however if i wanted to if i wanted it to be one two three and four so i can just that's what's going to happen here so you can see now this is one this is two this is three and this is four i can also rearrange them just as a single row and then they all arrange in a row or I can rearrange them in a single column. You can see here, they're all arranged from top to bottom. So this is how we maneuver our, out, our artboards in, in Illustrator. Remember, you can have as much as a, a thousand artboards in your Illustrator documents, and um, you can just work with them. You can use them to export, and you can also arrange them the way that you want. All right, that will, that will be it for artboards. Now in this section, we'll be considering the basic differences between pixels and vectors. Now understanding this helps you know how to differentiate between different file types, how to use them, and also how not to use them. So there is the 
vector file type and then there's the pixel file type so primarily illustrator works with vectors whilst um, a program that works with pixels primarily is the photoshop uh, program so i'll be switching between both programs to illustrate the differences between pixels and vectors now um, pixels work with um, this little little boxes um, that we, that's well are called pixels anyway um, and the idea is an entire image is made up of a combination of millions probably thousands um, of different boxes in different um, in, in different positions so the idea is a pixel a, a pixel is like the very basic unit of a, of, of a photograph such that the, by the time you zoom into it, it becomes um, you're, you're, you're getting closer to that very small unit. Now, vectors, however, do not use the pixel format in their, in, in, in their composition. But instead, they use, um, and let me just call it a mathematical function. That's like the basic difference. And one thing you'll notice about vectors is that no matter how much you zoom into a vector, it never loses its quality. It doesn't lose its um, resolution in that sense. So I have this document open here in my Adobe Illustrator. So I'm going to just um, try to zoom in. So you can see down here is my zoom level, which currently is 31.53. So let's go to, you can see in Illustrator, I have an enormous amount of zoom level that I can work with which is up to 64,000 <coughs> so let me move to a hundred percent view a hundred percent zoom here so you can see it's closer but you can see that there's no loss of quality let me move to 600 you can see me still zooming in on the tongue of this um, smiley of this of this um icon no matter how farther in i go i wouldn't lose any quality so let me just do my let me use my trackpad and pinch i'm i'm expanding now to zoom in on it so you can see no matter how much i go in this line stays as crisp and as sharp as possible so this is one of the beauty of working with vector. When you're working with the vector, you don't have any problem with this. So let me switch now to my Photoshop. So I, what I've done is that same file, I've exported it into the pixel format. So I've brought in the pixel format in here. And then you'll see what happens. So here you can see the same um, zoom level. So this zoom level here is for the illustrator. So let me just expand this a little so that I can cover it up. So you can see the zoom level here for my Photoshop is 33%. And by the time I go to, if I press, when I press Control or um, Control One or Command One, it goes to my 100%, which is the actual pi um, pixel size. So you can see this is 100%. Uh, it looks very good right now i mean it looks crisp you can tell you can you, you can tell that this is a very high quality um, export i did however let me let me now start zooming in more i'm on 196 right now and then you see now that i'm at 660 percent you already seen the grid lines of the pixel format here so this is where pixels and vectors get separated you can see I, by the time I am already reaching this level, even 400%, I already have pixelations happening. And that's because at this point, these pixels in here, they are separate boxes on their, on their own. And they have to take a particular color. Each box must have its own color. And that's why this, there just seems to be that form of um, pixelation. So you can see here a difference between vectors and pixels so let me switch back to my illustrator you can see the same file 
that I exported, no matter how, how much I go in, I'm still maintaining that level of quality. So vectors are amazing for preserving quality. They're amazing for zoom for for when you want to when you want to work with a file that you're going to have to expand a lot. The only disadvantage to vectors really is that they lack the ability to actually look um, photorealistic. So when you see a vector image, um, you you are, you're not you're not you're not likely to think that it's an actual photograph. So actual photographs, actual pictures, actual um, real life um, images um, are, al are almost always in the pixel format, whilst drawings, whilst illustrations, shapes, um, logos are in the vector format. So you'll be using the vector format um, a lot in Illustrator. There is also, of course, the pixel, the pixel, um, the pixel format available in, in Illustrator, but primarily in Illustrator, you will be working with vectors. And then one more thing in our view, in our view mode is um, Illustrator has this pixel preview, which tries to mimic what it will look like if your Illustrator file, which is a vector file, were to be previewed after exporting in the in a pixel in a pixel format. So by the time I select this pixel preview. I would expect that when I try zooming in, I'll be experiencing the same thing I experienced when I was in Photoshop. So let's, let me go ahead right now and zoom. So you can see I am in Illustrator right now. I'm an, and at 400%, I'm already experiencing some form of pixelation. So this is just to give you an idea of how much detail that you currently have, um, how, how, how clearly your file is going to be when you move it out of a vector based program and of course because uh, the, the makers of Illustrator understand that so a lot of times the files that you produce in Illustrator do not necessarily stay in Illustrator you want to have an idea of what it's going to look like when it moves to another program so you can see let me try that again so I'm zooming in with my pixel preview and then it's pixelating However, the moment I turn off, I go to view again and turn off my pixel preview, it becomes crisp, clear, and very sharp. So that's the difference between a vector and a pixel format. In this section, we'll be looking at the user interface of Illustrator and all the different options, all the different customizations that you can do to it just to make yourself more productive and also just to ensure that everything that you need is easily accessible. So first I would start off with the preferences which can be accessed by clicking this button here. You can see preferences here or you can go to Illustrator preferences and just open up the menu button over there. For Windows users, your preferences would be under Edit. So you click Edit, and then you'll be able to access your preferences. Uh, one of the um, one of the very first um, the very first tab that you're going to see there is the General tab, and you can see different options. For example, Show Tooltip. Now, Show Tooltip is very it's 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 crucial when you're just getting started in in Illustrator. You can see I have it uh, checked already. So let me show you what that is so um, whenever you hover your mouse over any any of the tools illustrator automatically gives you a hint into what that particular tool does so such that you are able to know if that's what you need at the moment and then it just gives you a little more information so when i hover over the t here you can see type tool comes out that's the name of the tool and also the keyboard shortcut so you can see the keyboard shortcut for the type tool is t so if i press t on my keyboard automatically the type tool is selected and uh, for selection here the keyboard shortcut is v so you press v and then i switch into selection mode i strongly advise that you keep your tooltip always open 
um, so that you are, as you learn, as you as you as you grow in in Illustrator, you are able to quickly know what tool you you're using. Believe me, even as a professional, you sometimes just need still need that hint to come out to know which tool you want to you, you want to use. Uh, I have the show hide and ruler across our all document also, um, and then different all different other. Um, user interface customizations that you can do um, I have the guide and grid colors so you can change the colors of the guide and grid and how they appear whether they appear as lines or they appear as dots um, hyphenation how words get broken once they move to another line all these imp all these um, options are here um, so an another option is the user interface option and um, you know this is the age of um, the dark mode where dark mode is coming to a lot of, um, op of, of a lot of um, softwares and illustrator is not left behind so we can switch between the brightness of our user interface here i'm currently in the darkest mode which is the dark mode um, by default it's usually uh, it usually comes in the medium dark so it's very likely that when you install illustrator for the first time you will be in the medium dark mode you can see this is another lighter mode which is the medium light and then this is the lightest mode available the just it's just a light um, I think this is quite blinding so I'm gonna go back to the dark mode now the dark mode is important because as a designer as an illustrator as someone who is creating um, who is doing creative work you tend to stare at your screen for prolonged period of time you're, you're, you're very likely to be at your screen for, uh, for, I don't know, for two hours, three hours, four hours, probably the entire day. And it's important that the amount of light hitting your eyes from your computer is minimized as much as possible so that you reduce um, eye strain. So it's usually advised that you go for a darker um, user interface brightness. There are times when, yes, you may want to use the lighter one, but then it's... Um, it comes down to preference anyway so but I, pr I prefer to be as um, for it to be as dark as possible all right so that's um that's for user um, the preferences you can always explore the different options that you have um the next i'll be i'll be looking at is the tool the toolbar on the left here on the far left and then the panels on the far right now by default the toolbars is here on the left panels on the right however you can always switch them up the way that you want um, the next thing i'll also be taking is um the uh, the workspace so in illustrator and many other adobe um, products the appearance of the toolbar and the panels and the canvas and every other thing is usually termed a workspace so everything that you can see right now here is believed to be a workspace so um, if, and this workspace is currently called essentials classic but then if i switch to essentials you'll notice that something will change about the arrangement okay so one thing you've noticed here is my toolbar was previously two columns so let me switch back to essentials classic so you can see that it had two columns as you can see here but under the essentials it's just one single column and then the panels that are available here are also different on essentials it's just the property the layer and the library that you're seeing here and whilst for my essential classic you can see a lot more other options there this is fully customizable there is no restriction as to how you can move things around so you need to be as flexible as you want to now as you can see here i have some my i have some of my panels so i have color guide i have brushes when you open up your illustrator there's a likelihood that it doesn't come out this way so let me show you how it's likely to be initially so this is what it usually is and of course in this in this form you can only see the icons so this is called the iconic panel state you can only see the icons and then you have to hover your mouse before the name comes out but uh, but as uh, as someone who's just getting started with illustrator you might want to expand this so that you have 
an idea what each tool is even before you hover your mouse over it and then you can always move these panels around whichever way you want at the moment these are all docked docked meaning that they are anchored to this column they are all arranged in this column however if you want them free you can also do that so let me bring out my swatch panel so you just click it and drag it out so the moment i do that it's now free to move and then i can just expand the panel here and then i have all the options so such that when i'm working on on a file i can just easily access the various tools so i'll just take my swatch back in here i'm just going to arrange it there remember it's fully customizable you can arrange it whichever way you want and then you can also save your different uh, workspaces so let's say i i want to bring brushes i want it to have another column of its own here and let's say i want to take properties i want to bring it under here so you can see i'm just um fooling around and just arranging them whichever way i want and then i can save this as a new work space i can just give it a new name my wonderful new work space so let's just be let's just fool around there so you can see here now this is the name i've given to this particular workspace and then if i want to switch back to the previous workspace i was in essentials classic essentials and then i can just always come back so illustrator always keeps a record of how you've arranged that workspace um, and then it gives you back that that default so in case someone comes into your uh, your program does some work on it and then they, are, they rearrange stuff remember that you can always reset it back to how you set things before so that's it for the panels that's it for the tool we've, we've covered the toolbar we've covered the preferences that you can make to your adobe illustrator just to customize it and ensure that you are setting yourself up for your maximum productivity now in this section we'll be looking at the properties panel now it can arguably be said to be one of the most important panels that you'll use whenever you're working in illustrator and it's uh, it was a fairly new feature it was introduced in 2018 um, to the to the uh, to that to the adobe illustrator um, program but then um, it's it's been a very wonderful um, addition so um previously we had the control bar up here which was where most of um, the controls actually happened but then with the properties uh, panel now you now have a, a more a, a richer and more contextual way of interacting with your design so let's so let's just um let's just check it out so when there is so this is it this, this is it here the properties panel so when nothing is selected you can see it says here no selection you can see no selection here because i don't have anything highlighted on my design so the general it's given you a general properties um, outlook so we can just look at that from top to bottom um, you can adjust the, the units um, from the, the pixel you can switch from one artboard to another so you can see if i click this arrow here i'm now jumping to the artboard 2 if i go back this is my first artboard 1 um, artboard 2 but three uh, highlights my adboard tool you can see the name here the number and the name there um, so let me exit that okay um, you can also edit your artboard that's when you're trying to um, that's when you're trying to do some form of editing to the artboard um, artboard options and, and all that so let me escape that you can also select your ruler and your ruler and guide so you can see at the moment I don't have any ruler visible but if I click this my ruler comes up so if I want to do some more precise measurement of my objects I can have a very good idea of that so let me unselect um, turn that off I can turn on my grid 
I can also turn on the, the transparency grid. So all these options are available directly from the properties panel. You can also turn on whether you want to hide your guides. So the guides are, um, the, the have my guides, I have my smart guide. So your smart guide, so you can see I'm moving this image, this um, item freely. However, if I have my smart guide, smart guide turned on, it's automatically aligning to nearby items. So it's just checking to be sure that I'm well positioned. So that's for the smart guide, for the guides. Um, then also the snap options, whether you want to snap to the grid, whether you want to snap, um, you, want to, you want to turn it off or you want to um, snap to pixel. So all these options are here. Um, and also you have um, the keyboard increment. So the keyboard increment, let me just um, illustrate that. By default, it's set at one pixel. That means that if I select this item and I hit my arrow key, so I'm going to hit my down arrow key now. You can see that the item is moving. Okay, maybe maybe it's not perceptible. Okay, you can see that it's moving. And for every time I hit my arrow key, you can see this item moving. However, if I adjust the, arrow, the increment to, let's say, 10, what will happen is with every with every time I press down the arrow key, it's moving a little more faster, as you can see there. So let's try a hundred. I expect it's going to move way more faster. So you can see it moves faster. So the, the times when you're working and you want your keyboard increments to be faster than the default, you can just easily adjust that there. So I can, I'll just take that back to one one point. And then there are also other options here. And then you can also quickly access your preference menu, which we had um, covered in previous modules so that's the property panel when nothing is selected the moment you select any of the items it contextually gives you the properties for that particular item so when i click this now you see i can now transform this um this group here so you can see i can adjust i can i can adjust the position the x and y position or i can adjust the width and the height which is the w and the h here i can do a rotation on the angle i can flip it i can flip along the vertical axis or along the horizontal axis so you can see there and i can also adjust the appearance i can do a part i can do the pathfinder the pathfinder talks about how you combine different shapes to form new ones for the appearance i can set the feel now the fill is it's not available here it's it, it has a question mark because i am selecting a group of items that have different fields so illustrator is practically asking me um, i don't know what color this i don't know what fill this group of items have so um you see the fill you see the stroke you can do the, op the opacity um so all the all these different options you can see here the opacity is reducing all these different options are available to you. Um, before this tool was introduced, you would have had to select your uh, item and go figure out or, um, which, how, to, how to get the properties for this item. But then contextually, you just select it here and everything pops up right there. Um, one more that we can also do is we can, so we've observed when we have no selection for our properties, We've observed when we have a particular item selected. Also, when you have a group of items selected, I'm dragging over all these three items now. The, con the context can also be different. So um, one interesting one I always like to use is the align um, panel. So the align panel is what you use to arrange your items to ensure that they are in a straight line as you want them to. So you can align horizontally. When I do that, you can see they all come together here and bunch up together. Let me control Z. Um, when I, I can align all the centers together, you see they all come together and align in the center. Undo. You can align to the right. So you can always do all these um, different options. So the properties panel is one panel that you are going to be using a lot. It makes your work very, very easy. It makes it um, it, ma it makes you work way faster and it also based on the items the item or the items that you're choosing 
it tells you all the different options that are available so that's the property panel over the course of this first section we've been able to take a look at a number of all the settings and personalizations and customizations that you can do to the illustrator interface to ensure that you are, are as productive as you can now we're just going to take a look at some more of this preference options uh, one of them is the tolerance level which is under selection and anchor display um, remember uh, I had mentioned earlier to, uh, to access the preference menu you go to illustrator and then you go to preferences however on the windows you go to edit and that's where you're going to see your preferences so on the selection and anchor display you can see the tolerance level which is um by default it's set to three 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 points and it basically refers to how close your cursor has to be to an object before illustrator is activated to identify that object or to pick that object or to interact with that um, object um, another important setting to note is on um, the command click to select behind so um like like most of the adobe um, products they tend to be layer based um, layer based being let me zoom in on this so that you can understand that layer based meaning that whenever an object is in front of another object the object behind is on you're unable to to pick it you're unable to select it with your mouse however with this um, option already available with, with this option already active you are able to do that so you can select an item that is behind so you can see here I'm holding down so let me escape that again so I'm holding down my command um, button ideally let me let me let me release the command button ideally whenever I click on this I can only select this P because that's where I'm select that's where I'm clicking on however if I want to select the objects behind I hold down my command and I'm able to access that document so we can see here the command click option you may decide that you want to um, turn it off but I'd advise that you keep it um, on for times when there are difficult to reach objects you can just use the command click to access them so there's a slew of other settings um, you have the zoom to selection you have the you can decide to show your anchor points in the selection tool on, on the shape tool you can constrain your path and dragon there's quite a number of um, different settings that you can that you can use whilst you're working in illustrator we're going to explore them as we go on in the course and um, you will be able to understand when to use them when not to use them and how to ensure that you are optimizing your work In this model, we'll be talking about the shape tools and the various ways in which you can use them. Now, the shapes are very basic, but they form a very powerful bedrock of all you get to do in Illustrator. So to access the shape tool, you can see it's right here. It's initially usually denoted as the rectangle tool, and by the time you either right click on the tool or you hold if you're using a touchpad you get you then get access to all the other tools available so what I'm what I'm going to do now is I'm going to click this little button on the edge here so that I can pop it out as a panel so you can see it's now a panel and then I can bring it out so there you have it so you can see first is the rectangle tool then the rounded rectangle tool, then I have the ellipse tool, the polygon tool, the star tool, and then the flare tool. So I'm gonna to get started with the rectangle tool. So once it's highlighted, you can just either click and drag. So you can see there's a lot of freedom as to how you can set the shape. So when you click and drag and release, 
a shape is formed. So that there I've drawn a rectangle. So after drawing, you can always resize it to whatever shape you want, so whatever size you want. So that's it. And you can see as you're dragging, you can see down here at the bottom corner, you can see the attributes of the shape. So I can see right now, the, I'm drawing a sh I, I'm, I have a rectangle which is having a width of 51.86 and a height of 48.33. So that's one method. You can either click and drag as I have done here. Another way you can Another way you can use the rectangle tool is just simply clicking. So if you just click once, it brings out this dialog box where you can enter the width and the height. So let's say I wanted to draw um, a 50 by, let's say 30 millimeter. Okay. And then it just appears at the point where I drew my rectangle. So you can see that you either click and drag or you just simply click and enter in your parameters. All right. Now, um, let's assume you wanted to draw a square. So a square and a rectangle are pretty much the same tool, except that in, this, in the, for a square, the width and the height have to be exactly the same. So you wouldn't find a square tool for in your basic shapes. What you will find is a rectangle tool. So how do you convert your, your rectangle tool to a square tool? What you do is you simply hold shift whilst you're clicking and dragging. So as I, I click and I've clicked and I'm dragging and once I hold shift, it converts that shape into a square. So you can see no matter how I move it, it stays equal proportions and that's how I get a square. So I just release and then I am good. Alternatively, I can also do the click and the click and enter method where I click and I want to have a, a, a square that is a hundred millimeters by a hundred millimeters. I just type 100, 100, enter. And then there I have it. I have a square. Now, so um, in order to move my tools around, I can just press V. Remember that's our selection tool up here. And then I can move it around. So let me delete all the shapes I've created. So far, I'm just clicking and deleting. Um, so I'm back again to selecting my rectangle tool. Whilst drawing your rectangle tool, this, there, is, there are some other controls that you can use. So let's draw my rectangle tool here. So you can see I've drawn it a little bit beyond bound and I just want to move. So you can move your tool, your, your shape around whilst you're even drawing. And what you do, so whilst I'm moving, you can see I haven't released yet. I hold down my space bar. Once I hold on my space bar and I start moving, it moves the shape around. So let's say I wanted to move this shape like to the top here. So once I release my space bar and I move, I'm back to resizing my shape. You see, I'm back to resizing my shape. Once I hold my space bar again, okay, so, so I'm back to resizing my shape there. Or I can just click. So that's that for the rect for how you draw your rectangle and your square. Other options that you have, you have the rounded rectangle. So the difference between a rounded rectangle and a rectangle is just that the corners are rounder, they're smoother. So, you, so let me draw that so you can see here, I have rounded edges in my rectangle. Of course, if I hold down the shift button, my rounded rectangle gets converted to a square. So let me release that. Now, whilst still holding and dragging, if I do not like the extent of the roundness, I can actually adjust it even before I release the button, before I release my drag. So what I can just do is I can press my up button. If you see, I'm press, as I'm pressing my up button, you can see the rectangle is becoming more rounded. If you can look, if you can see closely, you can see I'm holding down my up button is becoming more rounded. If I press my down button, it becomes less rounded. So you can see it's becoming a little less rounded. I'm holding it down for a while. So that's, so that might take a while to reflect. So you can adjust the roundness of your rectangle even before you release the tool. So you can see it's becoming more rounded and I'm also 
able to maneuver it and and release it so you can you can pretty much have any degree of roundness that you want i mean i've i've um, added so much roundness at this point where my tool actually my my shape actually looks more like a circle than a rounded rectangle so let me delete that and let's just start again so i have i have way too much i've added way too much roundness there So we have our, so that's the rectangle tool. We have the rounded rectangle tool. Then we also have the ellipse tool. So it's called an ellipse tool. You might also be, be, be looking for the circle tool. So the ellipse tool and the circle tool are the same and they have the same relationship that you have between your rectangle and your square. So by default, you're drawing an ellipse. If you want a circle, you hold down your shifts and the proportions stay the same for the width and the height all right so that's so that's that for for our circle tool so i can just press my v and then i move this up here now let's go to the next tool which is the polygon tool so when i click my polygon tool by default your polygon tool is a pentagon it has five sides as you can see so let's say I wanted a hexagon instead. What I just do is I hit my up button on the keyboard. So my, once, I, once I hit my up button, it adds an extra side to the polygon. So now I have an hexagon, which is six sided. I click my up button again, becomes a seven sided polygon and so on and so forth. I can keep adding sides. The same thing I can also reduce by clicking my down button on the keyboard. So you can see it keeps reducing it six sides five sides okay i jumped i jumped one there so that's four sides and then three sides so if you're wondering how do i draw a triangle a triangle is a polygon which you've reduced the sizes to the, the number of sides to three so you can always adjust that so let's say i wanted to move this around i just hold on my space bar and then i can move my shape around and then i release that so i have my triangle there so let's draw another so you can see by default triangle i increase my i increase my sides so let's say let's let's have a let's have a nice neat hexagon here and just kind of move it a little around there all right so there i have a hexagon and then i also have the star tool so the next tool i'll be talking about is the star tool so you can just click on the star tool here and then by default, you're going to have, let me move that a bit. By default, you're going to have a five pointed star. If you want to increase or decrease the number of points, just like you did with the polygon, you hit the up button. When I hit the up button, you can see it increases the number of side, the number of points rather to six. And then I can keep adding more points to my star or I can reduce by clicking, by hitting my down button on my keyboard. So I'm reducing that. All right. So another, another, attribute of the star um, shape is that you can actually reduce the pointiness of the star so not just the number of points that you have but how pointed your star is and to do that you hold your command key or control on windows once i hold it and i drag inside you can see how my star becomes less pointy and when i draw it out it becomes a little more pointy so you can adjust this even before you release your star so i can just do that there and have a nifty little five pointed star so we've been able to go through the basic shapes that you you have by default on on your adobe illustrator and for every shape you can always adjust your colors so by default you can see here if you look up here i have white as a color and black as my outline now here's now you it's you, you need to be very um conscious of the difference between a white background a white um white color and a transparent color so in this case you can see because what i have here you can see it's solid white this means it's white okay now let me let me duplicate this right now. So you can see I have these two different 
polygons, these two different hexagons, you can see they are both white. So I'm going to go ahead and change the color of this now to transparent. So you can see now this is a transparent polygon. This, however, is a polygon filled with white all through. They are very different. Um, if how 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 you can know that is by you may not be able to tell immediately when you put both of them. I mean, if I put if I put these two shapes on a white background, you really can't tell. But by the time I shift it this way, you can see the white is still extending here. And you can see that for this guy, it's not. Now, one thing you'd also notice is when a shape has a transparent feel, meaning it's, it doesn't have a color in between, in, in the middle, what this means is that the shape is hollow in that sense. And a hollow shape, you cannot click on the hole, you cannot click on it. So you can see, I have my, I have my selection tool here selected, and I'm try, I'm clicking, but Illustrator is not allowing me pick this shape because I'm clicking on empty air. If I can use that analogy, so to, to select this tool, I have to go to the edges because the edge is where something actually exists. Okay, so you can see when I come here and click, that is when I can select it. But because this guy is filled all through with the white color, I can simply click in the middle and he's and it's already selected. So you can see the difference between having a transparent fill and having a solid fill. It matters in how you are able to select the items. And of course, if you want to reset your 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 objects and properties, your fill and stroke properties to default, you just press D and you can see here it returns my objects to the default. So I pressed D there and it came back to the default of being filled with white and having stroke, a stroke um, outline color of black. You can also, I can always reduce, increase the size of the stroke as you can see here. And I can also change the color of my stroke to something pink and let's change the fill to, let's say something yellow. So, so there you have it. You can always change these colors as you want and of course you can also select multiple objects so i can just select this hold down shift and select this now here's the interesting thing that happens when you select multiple objects that have different properties this here has a white stroke this here has this right has a white feel rather a white feel with a black stroke this here has a yellow feel with a pink stroke so when you come up here you can see Illustrator just gives you that question mark because you've selected multiple objects. It can't decide which is the unique um, stroke or fill color. So that's why both of them are in question mark. So if I, if I select and select a particular color, it will now apply this new color to both of them. So you can see now I've changed both their fills to solid green. So that's how you apply multiple objects uh, apply uh, apply your, your feel and your stroke to multiple objects now you can also do some shape manipulation in illustrator and this is where it really gets very very interesting so rather than doing a selection tool which is my v you can select you can select the direct selection tool which is has the shortcut of a so v is what we've been using all along. We just use it to move around. However, when I click A, I have all these anchor points available to me. So they are called anchor points. They are like the nodes of a shape. So let me escape that. So let's let me press V, escape. So let me select this and press A. So you can see the different anchor points available. And all these are very important. Usually, um, there's an anchor point at the edge which forms the corner which forms the boundary of a shape and sometimes you may have another anchor point in the middle inside of the field i'm going to get in a bit to what the difference between those are so you can see when i select this you can see there are anchor points at the corner here and then there are also anchor points in the middle here so let me press v i press i select this i press a so you can see I have these anchor points at the edges and then I have um, some other sets of anchor points in the middle. So we're going to explore what these different 
anchor points do. So let me go back to, let's start with a triangle. So I press my A. Now the anchor points at the edge are meant to increase the, sh the uh, by, uh, by default, they're supposed to, you use them to modify the shape. So when I select, when I, when I select A and do this, you can see they are all selected. And how I know that is because all of them are in solid blue. However, if I click on one of them, you can see now only this one is selected whilst the rest are now hollow. With this, I can now modify this particular anchor point and drag it anywhere I want. So let me see. So you can see, I can drag it any way I want to. So that's one very nifty way of modifying your shape into whatever you want. So I can come here and select on this again. You can see I can move it about anywhere I want to click on this. So your ability to modify a node is when it is selected and it's solid blue and the other nodes are white. So you can see here. So let's let's try that with this. I select on, so you can see every, you can, um, so let's, I think it might be difficult for you to appreciate this. So let me, let's choose a different, all right, so I do my A again. Okay, so you can see all my exterior nodes are actually solid blue right now. But if I select, if I click again, only one is. So I can modify the shape any way I want. So you can see I just turned this into an interesting um, admiral kind of um, arrow. And then I can always move it about any way I want. So y there is room for you to maneuver your shapes whichever way you want. There is no limit to the amount of creativity that you can bring in. Now it's looking a little more like the Budweiser kind of um, shape. So you can see there, there is a lot of room for with which you can maneuver your shapes. Now we've talked, those are the exterior nodes, which are the solid blue ones. There are, however, these circular nodes also that tend to come um, in the middle um, of, of the shape. So let's, let's explore what those do. So what, what, what they do is they adjust the roundness of the corners. So let me go back. So when, what, what they do is um, pretty much similar to what you have between a rectangle and a rounded rectangle. So if I, if I wanted to convert my regular rectangle into a rounded rectangle, these are the tools that I would use. These are the, these are the nodes that I will be able to, I'll be able to pull in in that sense. So you can see when I hover over them, you can see that little curve that comes up at the bottom right corner of the tool. If I drag that in, you can see it adjusts the roundness for all my corners. Okay. Now, however, if I only wanted to adjust the, the roundness of one single corner, I click again. And now you can see that there is a different, this, it looks different from every other one. You can see that there's a difference between this circle here and this one. So if I drag at this point, only the roundness of this particular node will be adjusted. So you can see that. So if I click on this also, so if I click on this also, I can adjust its own roundness separately. If I click on this guy, I can adjust its own roundness very much separately. So we have two tools, important tools in our shape um, section that just allows us to be able to maneuver our shapes exactly as we want and as nimbly as possible. And of course, by the time you do this, you can always do different combinations of your tools. You can select both of them together. You can click your combine and then there you have it. There's a new tool. There is, a, there is no limit to the possibilities that you can have with your shape tool. So that pretty much covers the shape tool for Illustrator. You can use it. You can always um, maneuver it whichever way you want.
In this section, we're going to explore a little more about the transform options that we can apply to our different shapes. So just go ahead right now and create a rectangle. Draw a nice little rectangle there. So it has, by you can see my default settings here are a yellow fill and a red um, stroke. So although you may not be able to see the stroke right now, you can see it there. So let's just increase the size of the stroke a little. All right, so that we can appreciate it a little more. All right, so you can see this is my shape. Um, when I click on the shape with the direct selection, with the selection tool rather, you can see this blue box which shows me the edges of my shape and it's called a bounding box. And if you go into your view, you will be able to see it here, hide. So you can either show or hide the bounding box. If I click hide, you see I don't I don't see that box anymore, but I just want to have it visible there. So I'll go back and show my bounding box. So uh, previously, we had, um, we had, we had, in a previous model, we kind of covered the corner widgets here, but we'll just go over them one more time. Um, so if I want to resize my shape, I can just click on this here to increase or decrease it. And also, um, I can hold down my shift. Now remember, we used the shift button to create a square when we were drawing afresh. But if I want to, you can see this rectangle seems to have a like a let's say four let's say four by three um ratio meaning the width the height is about in the ratio of four while the width maybe about three or three point five um i really can't tell but let's say i want as i resize i want to maintain that ratio what i can do is hold down my shift button and that way no matter how i increase or reduce it it's going to maintain that original aspect ratio. So it's called constraining the, 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 the attribute. So holding down shift constrains your movement to that particular aspect ratio. So I'm to, to see more transform to transform options. I can just open my transform panel here. Um, so I can, you can see it right here. If it's if you don't have it visible in the current um in the current um, outlay that you have, you can just go to view, uh, sorry, go to windows, and then you scroll down to be sure that you transform. Yes, so you can see, you can see it here. You can just use you can just use that to highlight your transform panel. So when I open up my transform panel, there's there's a slew of um options that I can choose from. Uh, so we're just going to explore all these options one by one. Uh, so first you see the X and the Y value. Now the X and Y value um, should not be confused with your W and H, which is your weight and height value. Your X and Y value are your coordinates. So they, are, they, are, they tell you the position of the object in the artboard, okay? Um, and they're kind of like, like, like GPS coordinates, like longitude and latitude, to let you know exactly where your um, coordinates are. However, in, whenever you're using your X and Y, something you must always take note of is what you have as your reference point here. So you can see here that my reference point is selected as the middle of the right side of the shape, okay? And um, what that means is this particular reference point, which I would say somewhere around here, is having an X value of 152 and x value so means from here to from the edge here which is zero up to this point is about 152 and a y value of 137 that means from my top here down to this point is 137 now you'll notice let me switch my reference points to the middle you can see what happens is that my y value did not change because these two points are on the same, have the same y value. The distance from here to here is the same as the distance of here to here. My y value did not change. But my x value got a little shorter. It's now 97 because previously I was, this was here to here was 152, whilst here to this place is only 97 when I change it. So when I, if I, I can move, the, uh, the reference point. Let me move. Let me move to the top corner here. 
which is here. So it's telling me that I have an X coordinate of 42, meaning here to here is 42, and a Y of 66.4. This is 66.4. So I can use this to actually just move my shape wherever I want. So I can adjust, if I adjust this X value to let's say 20 and my Y value to also 20, you can see my shape has moved using this reference value. Now this is 20. So this tells me I'm 20 millimeters from the edge here and also 20 from the edge here. I can also make it zero, zero, zero. And then my shape moves right to the top left corner of my diagram of my artboard rather. So I can move that back in here so you can see. So this helps you keep track of the coordinates of your shape. Here is the actual dimension of the shape, which is the weight and the height. And this button here is similar to what your shift button does. So when it's select when it's selected, it means that your shape, your shape, um, your, your transformation is going to be constrained. And when it's not, it means that it will not well, it will be able to adjust. So, so um, it's so it, the constraint here, however, is only used when you type it. So let's say I do a hundred. The moment I press enter, it's going to adjust. It adjusted that 142 I had previously. So let me control Z. Okay. So you see here I have 110 and 142. So because it's constrained, whenever I reduce this value. Let me change it to 200. The 101, the 142 would also have to adjust to match this 200 value. So now you can see it's 258. It had to adjust um, um, up, uh, accordingly. However, if I click here and hold down my shift, I can adjust it back constraining. All right, so the next um, option you can see here is the rotation. Uh, so you can use this to just simply rotate your shape. So I can go from zero to up to 330, but um, 360 comes back to zero. I mean, it's the same thing. So I can just click 30 and then I'm rotating 30 degrees. Now, remember all these tools all work with this reference point here. So because my reference point is at the top corner here, it is rotating this shape around this axis so you can see ideally um, my shape should not be so let me go back so if i go back if i bring the reference points right to the middle now if i rotate i expect that my shape will just simply rotate around this center here so you can see 30 so you can see it's rotating accordingly okay So that's that's what it so but however if I, if I want to rotate up around a particular center of a particular reference point I can just adjust the reference points there and then by the time I rotate it's going to be you can see it just took it up there because it was rotating around this particular oh, oops okay let me control Z and come back all right now the next so the next um, option you're going to see in the transform box is the shear. Now shear is, if you're familiar with Photoshop, is um, similar to the skew um, option where you just want to lean um, a particular shape. So let me show you what shear will do. So I'm at zero percent right now. I'm at zero degrees rather because of the way that's the default when I draw. So let me do a shear of minus 30. So it's going to lean the shape to the left to the next because negative goes this way the positive values go this way so you can see it has turned my rectangle into something sort of a parallelogram so you can see that there now one thing one interesting thing about the shear tool where it really differs from the um, rotate tool is that every time you shear it comes back to zero so I did a minus 30 share. I can't just simply do, I can't just um, simply re reset it back to zero and it goes back to zero. No, it now takes this as the new normal. So min the minus 30 I did, it takes it, it now assumes that this is now the new zero. So if I want to go back, I have to actually press control Z. So I need to press, I need to um, undo, undo that in order to go back. All right, so that's the share. I can also share in this um, positive way. And so let's see if I 
So if I do, a, I can do a positive, a plus 30 share. You see what I did? I did a plus 30 share. It landed this way. However, to return it back to the original, I have to do a minus 30 share in order to come back to the original shape. So you need to keep that in mind for your, for your tool. So let me control Z so I can have my rectangle back. So the, one, the moment I shared, the moment I used the share, my, um, if you notice my rectangle properties, they all disappeared because it's, I had kind of deformed the shape. Uh, so the other rectangle properties, you can see here the rectangle weight, the rectangle height. You can use that to constrain. Um, you can also adjust the rectangle, the angle, which is very similar to what we, what we have here. But this is specific to the rectangle tool. This is the shape, the corner type, the, um, the corner type, which is similar to what this corner widgets do. So if I, If I go here and I increase it, you can see all the corners are becoming a little more rounded as I increase. So that's similar to, you know, to access this tool here, it's similar to what I would just click here and drag it in to my, to my, to my desired level of roundness. And you can always adjust the corner typing so you can see it's not a regular, it's not a regular type. You can select which particular um, corner type that you want. So there's really a lot of manipulations that you can do from the transform, from the transform panel. So I'm going to, we're going to look at the last two options I have here, which is the scale corner and the scale stroke and effect. So I, I pretty much like this um, scale corner and scale stroke and effect too, because it's important, especially when you're trying to create um, a, a particular brand identity, it makes your work very easy. So let's assume, um, let me, let me take, let's assume this, this right here is a, let me try to recreate, for example, the National Geographic um, logo. You know, it, it's just, it looks like a, it has a it has a trans a transparent let me let me use black and then it has a feel of something in the something in the yellow range so let me let me try let me see if I can do white now all right so let's assume this was like our national um, geographic um, logo and um, I wanted to increase this or reduce it so I have I currently have my stroke set to around 21 as you can see. Uh, uh, let me let's increase that a little and okay so maybe this looks this looks more like the National Geographic let's just for let's just assume this is what the, the National Geographic logo look like with a, a stroke of 37 so here's the thing if I reduce this shape holding on my shift I'm constraining my constraints mean I'm, I'm constraining my um, my dimensions meaning my width and my height are going to stay the same I hold on shift and I reduce it. Okay. So now I have a problem. You can see my shape has practically disappeared. And that's because as far as Illustrator is concerned, it's maintaining a stroke of 37 points, which because of what I'm trying to do is not making sense. I don't need it to, main, to maintain the stroke of 37 when it, the shape is that small. And of course, the same thing is going to apply if I actually try to increase the size of the shape. So the, the, the stroke is going to remain 37 no matter how much I scale up my, 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 my shape. So that's where the scale stroke and effect comes into play. So once I click that, Illustrator remembers the proportion of this stroke width to the entire dimension of the shape and it will it's going to adjust the stroke based on the size of the shape so let me scale this down now and here you'll see what happens you can see that the stroke also reduced and now it's just a mere 8.3 point this is very useful when you're trying to maintain some particular proportions as you're trying to create some um, some brand identity. So I use it a lot when I'm trying to create a brand identity and I just want to be able to scale up um, or reduce 
that particular um, item. So that's what um, your scale stroke and effect is used for. Uh, it's in a very similar vein. That's how the scale corner works. So, um, so this, for the scale corner, um, at this at this very big at this very big size, let me adjust the corner roundness so you can see I have a very nice corner roundness here. So when I do not have my scale corner highlighted, let me reduce it, and you'll see that we'll be having the same problem that we had in the stroke you can see because i reduced it it practically became a circle because of the way my corner roundness is so let me adjust as you can see the, it's maintaining that corner roundness no matter the size of the shape so when i however do my scale corner and i reduce what happens is my corners reduce in respect to the dimension of the shape so no matter how much I increase or reduce the dimension. The corners are dynamic to the um, to the to the to the dimension, so the width and the height. So that's very important for making your work easy when you're working on um, different shapes. So that's that's for the transform tool. You can always explore this. It really comes into into play when you're trying to maneuver your shapes. So in this exercise, we're going to try to use all that we've learned so far to so just try to recreate a simple logo. In this case, the Mitsubishi logo. So I've gotten a PNG of the internet of um, showing the logo so we can see it here. And then we'll just be able to easily recreate it. Now, uh, the beauty of Illustrator is that there are plenty different ways to actually skin a cat. There are a lot of ways that you can do this. You can even, as you go on, as you become more proficient in the, in the course, you can actually find way easier ways of drawing it. But I just want us to apply what we've learned so far to try to recreate this. So I'll go ahead and um, I can see that this appears to be three basic um, shapes which are arranged in a, in, a, in a rotation format, in a circle. They're all they're equal um, distance to each other. So I'll just go ahead and draw myself a, a, rectang a rectangle here. Uh, okay, so I can see the color is already quite similar to what I have there. And um, I would want to start by using the shear tool, which we explored earlier, because I'm just trying to lean it a little to the to the left, and so that it looks like something here. So I think that looks fine. I'm not exactly trying to create an exact replica. I just want to use it to demonstrate um, what we've learned. So, so you definitely should be able to produce something probably more um, more accurate if you if you try it. Next time, I want to adjust. So I go to my direct selection tool because I want to just adjust these anchor points just to be sure that I'm okay with them. So I can, let's say, drag this a little here, and then I can click on this, maybe make it a little more, a little slimmer. Yeah, so I kind of think that looks good for me, for starters. So that looks fine. Uh, so the next thing I want to do is I want to make a duplicate of this and then rotate it. So I can just hold on my Alt, and then I drag. So the moment I did that, it has duplicated it. So you can see these are two. They are two different, two different shapes here. Uh, so next, I want to rotate. I want to rotate this from here to here. Um, so I can use my rotate tool, and then I drag. Now, if I simply rotate the way it is, I mean it's going to. It's just going to simply rotate around this axis. But I don't want that. I want it to rotate. So I want it to rotate around this particular point here. So I'm just, I can just click here and have it rotate. And then by the time I rotate it, so you can see, yeah, and then I take it up and that looks fine enough. And then I can also, so that looks a little that looks a little fine but I can see the edges are not um, aligning so that means that whatever I did here 
wasn't um, as good in output of course this is simply for practice sake so I can just come in here and I select I click on this particular node to highlight it only I adjust this I click on this and then I can bring it down a little and then I mean it's looking a little more um, rounded the way it's supposed to be and then I can make a duplicate go back here make another so that make another hold on my alt my up all my option and drag it again so I just made another copy of the rectangle here I'm just gonna nudge it up a little now I'm going to now share it now I shared it I think I shared it 30 degrees initially so when I share it uh, so maybe I didn't use okay maybe I didn't use 30 so when I share it oh, control Z so I'm trying to now unshare so I'm gonna do a positive share so I go, I go 30 and let's do 30 again okay it's probably not looking as maybe another 10 let me add another 10 all right anyway um, it's it's not exactly the same but you get the entire idea so I just used a simple shape drawing and then using the share um, feature in the transform panel to actually just transform this into the Mitsubishi logo and then I can just add add some text at the bottom Mitsubishi I don't um, I don't think I have the exact font that was used here but I'm just going to do something very close so that's a pretty simple way of um, trying to reproduce the Mitsubishi logo so you just also go ahead and do yours now in this model we're going to learn how we can combine different shapes to form a new type of um, shape so we've ex we already explored the rectangle we've explored the ellipse so let me just bring this out here we'll explore the ellipse so you can see uh, so let's just try to see how we can combine these different shapes in order to form a brand new one so we can just go ahead and draw my ellipse tool here so let's make it a perfect circle and then I can hold down my options button or my alt button on on windows and then I drag that let me hold it down again I drag that there all right so now I have three different circles there so I can just go ahead and select them all I can select them all I open up my pathfinder panel some pathfinder panel here if you don't have it already selected you can just go into your windows and have it highlighted there so I can just combine this so I've, able, I've been able to combine these three items into one single shape so you can see it's a part so it's it's labeled a part here I can I can apply different I can apply stroke to it I can increase let me increase okay I can I can decide if I want it not to have a feel so you can see there it's just a hollow So that's just a very simple way of um, creating a, a new a new path a new shape by combining different ones now something else I can also do is so let's assume I wanted to have a, a line in the middle so I can just come and draw let's draw a, a rounded rectangle area right in the middle so and I just let's say I adjust this a little um, I can reduce the stroke all the way down but give it a feel so so this here is I'm just gonna paint it so you, this is a different shape so let's assume I want to take out this rounded rectangle out of the, the shape I have here already so I can just highlight both of them together and I come to minus front so that's the next one in shape mode so when I do that, so you can see now the shape has taken taken out this space here in the middle. 
So um, of course, when I reduce the stroke, you can see the stroke of this new shape adjusting accordingly. I can give it a new color, purple, or well, let's try blue, for example. So you can see here there are, um, there are a myriad of ways in which we can make this combination. All right, so that's one example. So let's try another. Um, we can also do, so let's attempt to do a, a Christmas tree, for example. So I, I take my polygon tool and um, I reduce my number of sizes, my number of sides to a, rect to a triangle. And then I have that there. Um, so let's paint this green with a, let's say with a red, the red kind of um, stroke. So I can just also do hold on my Alt or my Option key and then drag it down, hold it down again and drag it down. Let me adjust the size of this a little. So just, I just want to reduce the size of this a little. So basically I'm just trying to manipulate some of this so I can this this shape so I can add, take all of them and combine them together and there you have it I have a kind of a Christmas tree I can have the littles if I want to have the stem of the tree I just draw this down here and then so let's and then if I select both of them come back to my selection tool and select both of them here and then there I have a very simple Christmas tree kind of shape so these are various ways in which you can combine your shapes together so one other way to use the combining of the combining of tools is also to use the expand tool so i'm going to go ahead and and i'll just quickly show you why the expand tool is very important so let's say I had this circle. So let me let me give it a much thicker stroke. Okay, so this looks good. So I have so I have this here, and um, let's assume I want I want to come up with a a logo ish that had that divide and something like this that divides this entire circle into two. So I'm I'm just gonna go ahead and show you initially what it's going to look like before I do the expand and then I'll show you what it looks like afterwards. So if I do a minus, a front minus back. So you can see here, what it did was it cut this circle using the rectangular shape I had selected. However, it's now added the stroke to this place. Okay, so let's assume I do not want this and I'm going to show you how it's going to how it's going to look like so I do control Z okay and I can just select this particular shape and go to object and expand and then I want the fill and stroke to be expanded so once I have this to selected and I'm okay so you can see now it's taken what it has done is it has made this it has made the stroke it has turned it into a fill and that's why you can see through the outline. So let me try that again now that I've expanded the tool. So we can see it, it gives me a different, a different feel, a different cut. So let's go back um, and try one more, one more way. So the other, the, the final one is let's assume I do not have any, um, any stroke, any feel rather at all. So I've tested it with if I had a feel and a stroke selected. And now I'm going to test it with if I do not have a fill selected. So I'm going to do that again and then do a cut. So, okay, so I didn't expand this time. So I'm going to click again. So I'm just, I'm just allowing you to see all the different um, ways by which we can manipulate shapes. So I'm selected it again now. So I go back and I expand my fill and my stroke. I ensure that both are selected. Okay. So now my shape is now a solid, is now like a solid O. It's a, so it's now a, a hollow, a hollow ellipse. And then when I now select it with this, 
and do my cuts so you can see now it's it's different so you can see the difference between this different um this district and then the beautiful thing is i can now adjust this according as i can change the color and then i can also add a new stroke to it so that's one of the ways so that's one of the beauty of the expand tool whenever you're trying to make some adjustments to your to your shapes so remember the expand it can, can be used to give you different forms of expressions when you're trying to combine shapes now we're going to use the knowledge of what we've learned so far to create or would i say attempt to recreate the skype logo which i have in here it's a fairly simple logo but then with what we've learned we can see that it can simply be decomposed into a circle here another circle here another circle here all combined together into a shape and then with the s so just quickly go ahead and do that so i first draw my first circle so let me make it that way um, I change the fill from yellow to white i increase the stroke just to match kind of match yeah so i think that looks that looks fair enough then i draw another circle at the top here okay that looks good and then I duplicate, I press V for selection, and then I duplicate this and put it somewhere down here. All right, so I have my three shapes that I want to combine together. I can just go ahead and highlight all of them. I can either go here and click my Pathfinder and unite them together, or I can go to the Shape Builder tool, and I simply drag, do my wiggle over it there. And there you have it. So as you can see, I think my my corners here bulge in a little too much. So I can just control Z and I adjust I adjust that. So I drag that in a little more. So that it's just popping out a little. I drag this also in a little more. And then yeah, I think that should be good. So I highlight and select again. I then go to my ship builder. I drag all over it and then yeah I think that looks pretty good enough and I simply add a text so I type S um, okay I'm in Calibri that looks fine and then I increase the size a little more and then I drag it right to the middle so let's give it a little stroke so it has a feel of, of the blue right now uh, let me also give it a stroke of blue and then increase the stroke a little so that it can make it a little more sturdy. Yeah, so create the Skype logo. So now we'll be exploring all the different ways by which we can select items in Illustrator and just so that we can make our work as easy as possible. Now you're already familiar with the regular way that we do it. We can, we can, I can select this item, I can select this, I can select these different elements in my artboard um, that's one another method that you can use is the magic wand tool and i really like this tool because it's very intuitive and what it does is when you select the magic wand tool it's just right underneath the selection tool here or you can use the keyboard shortcut of y just press y and you have your magic wand I press v back i have back, I'm back to my selection tool i press y i go back to my magic wand what the magic wand does is when you click on an item it automatically figures out other objects in your art boards across all your art boards that have a similar attribute to what you have selected so for example i know that if i use my magic wand tool right here on this oval shape which is the eye of my emoji here i would expect that it also captures this eye because they have the same color and I, I probably expect that this would also be also captured and probably the eyes here so let me go ahead and select yes so you can see when I selected that it captured this yeah it also captured this because they have the same color and even down here it captured all these shapes let me go to so all my other art boards yeah so you can see it has selected all the shapes all the all the different shapes that have the same attribute as 
what I had selected there. So let me deselect. I press escape. Um, I, I press my V and then I can just click anywhere. So let me try it on this blue tier here. As you can see, I expect that it should also capture this here. So I go my magic wand and I select. So you can see I have it select. I have this selected and I also have the tiers here selected. So it's a very nifty tool for just capturing objects that have similar attributes to what you're trying to select. So that's that for the magic wand tool. Then there's also the lasso tool. So the lasso tool is underneath the direct selection tool and you can access that by just pressing Q. And so the, what the lasso tool does is you can just use it to draw around all the objects you're trying to select. So I can just go like this and by the time I'm done, you can see it has selected these two items. So I can just escape that and you can use it to move around. So let me try that again. Um, let's see on this, I'll just draw my lasso tool just around it. And then I can move these two items or do any manipulation that I want. So the lasso tool is very, very um, interesting. Um, let me try it one more time on more direct elements of my object here. So I can just draw a lasso tool around the mouth here. And yes, yeah, so you can see it also captured this particular crystal. So it captured the mouth quite all right, but then because my lasso tool touched this item, so I can just switch to my selection and hold down shift and click and click this to either include it or remove it so now i have removed it from but if i want to add it back i hold down shift and i add it back or i can hold down shift and remove it okay so holding down shift will remove items from your selection so if i hold down shift if I hold down, if I click this here, so I've selected this part of the mouth. If I hold down shift and click this, I've included this eyes. If I hold down shift, I've included this eye also, and now I have this entire selection. So you can use shift to just manipulate your, all your different, um, all your different selections. Now, one other thing I can also try is, let's assume I'm trying to select this entire, um, I, um emoji here, but you see this, base here which um, I can just move around you can see that I let's assume I do not want it selected as part of my selection so what I can just do I can highlight it select and then go to object and lock selection when I do that it's no longer clickable so you can see it's now been locked that way if I try doing my lasso again the same way I did it the last time you'll see that only the mouth is selected. Now I can't select it because I've locked the entire face here. All right. So it's a very um, useful way of you just being able to lock some particular objects and then you don't have to select them. So let me go ahead and unlock that there. So I can just right click on it and undo lock. And now it's now available now also another selection technique that you can use is when you want to select everything apart from one single item so let's say for example i wanted to select everything except this particular love icon i can just i select this and then i go to select and i click on inverse so what it has done now is that selected everything on my document except this single eye. However, one thing you almost also remember is whenever you have multiple artboards, I'm zooming out right now. Whenever you have multiple artboards and you use this feature, it also selects everything else in the other artboard. So I'm going to go ahead and move this selection right now and I expect that this single love icon here is not going to move. So we can see there, I moved everything and this did not move so that's the power of the select in verse now in this video we'll talk about how to work with precision in illustrator now we've talked about the alignment the distribution however there's the times when 
whilst you're working you just want to dynamically be able to be precise so that's what we're going to talk about here and i'll first start with the smart guides so the smart guides you've probably noticed them a lot of times whenever we are moving objects around so i'm going to make a duplicate of this green rectangle that i have here i'll hold down my options key and drag down so you can that purple line that you can see connecting the center of the in the first green rectangle to the second one i'm drawing is what we call a smart guide so when i release that i can be certain that the two centers were aligned because as at the time i released it that smart guide showed me that it was a straight line so let's say i move this if i move this around and i move it back so as i move it back you can see the smart guide appears to tell me that i can align their edges together if i release i can be certain that these edges are aligned together and if i move a little more i can see now the their edges are now their centers rather are now aligned here so let me make another copy duplicate um, and then you'd see how the smart guide also helps me position so first you can see i can i can be certain now that the centers of the second and the third rectangle are aligned and when i move it up a little more you see those two arrows there they also tell me that the spacing is also equal and a small dialog box usually comes up that pops up and tells you exactly what that spacing is so at the moment it's 18.3251 millimeters so when i release this i can be certain that this three rectangles are aligned by their center and the spacing between them is also equal so smart guides kind of help you do your align and distribution almost at the same time now apart from having to use the guides of the object already on your artboard you can also create your own guides and to do that you simply just drag out a guide from your ruler now at the moment i do not have my ruler visible so i'm going to show you how to make your ruler visible you simply go to view and then you scroll down here to ruler and then you say show rulers so you can see now i have my ruler i'm gonna i believe this is in millimeters so to to get out a guide to bring out a guide you just click inside the ruler and drag out so when i click and drag out you see there a guide comes out for me so you pick up a, a a horizontal guide from the top here and then i can also pick up a, a vertical guide from in here so just click and drag if i want to turn a vert an, an horizontal guide into a vertical guide i just press my alt and then it turns into a horizontal guide but i release that back and it goes back to being a vertical guide so once i have my guides drawn i can simply move my objects and then the moment i get it close it's already snapped to the guidelines so i can just take everything and snap them let me change the color of this to blue i can change the color of this also to something reddish okay so i can just move everything and snap them to the guide i can also take it up here and snap so they all get snapped yeah so that's how you use guides in illustrator one other thing you can do is that you can actually convert an object into a guide and to do that you i'm going to make a copy of this blue box here i can just drag it here and then i go to view i go to guides and i go to make guides so once i click that it's also my control so control 5 is the keyboard shortcut to that so it converts this object into a guide so i can now move objects around it and use them to align so you can see here or i can just come here and to align. so let me move this out of the way so that the, the snapping is more precise okay so i take that so you can see that it's just using it's just um snaps to the object as a guide so this is how, this is one of the ways where you can use guides to really ensure that you are as precise as possible now beyond guides you also have what you call grid in 
Illustrator, which is um, another better form of guy. So I can just delete. I can go ahead and just delete this guy out. So, so to delete the guy, you just highlight it and press the delete button. Select it and press the, the delete button. Uh, one more thing, you can also decide where you want to put your guide. So let's say I just bring a guide here. And I want this guide to be exactly uh, maybe 50 millimeters from the top here. So I select the guide. And then I can kind of drag I can kind of drag it up to the point so I can just I keep my eye on the dy function there and then you can just get an approximate value of your guide there. So you can also use the grid function. So the grid is usually uh, by default it's not visible but then you can unhide it so I can go to view and then I go down here to show grid I want to show grid I also need to ensure that I am snapping to grid so here's what the grid is for so you can see the grid gives you this graph like um graph paper like um feature on on your illustrator and then you can actually align your object straight to the grid so for example I can if you can see closely you can zoom in a little okay so you can see as I'm moving it just keeps snapping to the grid I'll never be at a point where I'm in between any of the grid items so no matter how I move I get snapped to the grid and also when resizing snap to grid also works because it just keeps snapping you to each of the grid boxes and this is always great so that if you want to have a particular amount of space in between your items it just makes it easy so let's say for example i want to have this is four tiny boxes between this first this first and second i can just bring it here also and I also have one two three for the same four tiny boxes i do not have to go and select everything and do a distribute or distribute spacing this helps me work better um, sometimes the grid that illustrator presents to you at first may be too small or it may be too big you can always adjust your grid settings you go to illustrator you go to preferences and then you go to guides and grid so at the moment it's grading for me every 25.4 millimeters and it's subdividing each grid into eight so let's say i wanted i wanted to increase that to let's say 50 to guide uh, to to grid every 50 and maybe just divide into four so you can see my grid has become uh, much more much more um condensed so i can also adjust my image my objects rather so i can just snap Snap the corner there, yeah, and then snap like this. So you can see it just makes so um, I have each object, I have this object as three, it's three grids in length, and it's one, two, three, four. It's I'm increase this a little, and it's six, so it's three, six. So I can just also readjust that to three and then increase this to six. So with one grid spacing in between. So this is a very easy way of just working precisely. Um, so let's assume I wanted to create something like a bar chart that had for my different for my different um, elements. So this is a very easy way to use the grid function and easily work with precision in Illustrator. Now, one of the skills as a designer is that you can easily look at a logo and decompose it into its various forms. So what I can see here, I can see that the logo is simply a circle that has some parts chopped off and then it's divided into gray, it's divided into segments and painted different colors. So we're just going to go ahead and jump right into it. So I will start with an ellipsis tool because I want to get this entire complete circle. So I can draw the circle, I hold on my shift so that it's a perfect circle. Um, I think that 
there should be good. I can always re I can always readjust it. I'm going to give this circle a stroke, so you can see you can barely see the stroke there. But now I'm going to increase the size until I think I am fine. So I think this looks good. It looks it looks it looks good enough. Now I'm going to remove the fill. I don't need the fill. Now at the moment this is a shape that just has a thick stroke. However, I need this entire the thickness of the stroke that I'm seeing right now to become the fill. And to do that, remember we go to object and I go to expand. However, when I'm expanding here, I don't click fill. So I only need the stroke to be expanded. So when I do that, okay, now all I have is an entire a ring. So now I have a red ring. You can see that the stroke and the fill colors have been switched. I can paint it different colors, you can see. So this is good enough for me to start. So let me just start, let me put that in. I can really put that in any color I want. All right, so the next thing now is I can use a rectangle to start cutting out parts of this ring here. So I can just have my rectangle, let me have it a different color so that we can always keep track of how we are moving it in relation to the circle. So I just use my Alt option to copy. Now first I want to, first what I want to do is I want to create this cut up here. I want to be able to cut this part off. So I'll just bring it here and reduce it a little. Then I'm going to rotate. So I go to my rotate tool with R and I'm going to rotate until I think my angle is good enough. Now I'm not exactly trying to be precise here, but I'm just for the purpose of teaching. So I think that looks that looks good for me. So now all I'm, all I'm really concerned about is this top part cutting, being able to cut it off. So I'll select this to this object and this object. I open my pathfinder and I do a minus front. So once I do that, you can see my rectangle got cut out of the ring circle. And I think I'm fine with this. Then I'm going to also be cutting out. So I need to cut out a little portion here so that this becomes level, this becomes straight. So I'm also going to copy my rectangle again and put it here and then I arrange it somewhere here and then I reduce it this way. So now remember because I just created this new shape which is my ring that has a little part cut off it is in front of this rectangle in here so I need to arrange I need to take this rectangle to the top so I right click I arrange and I bring to front. So now that the rectangle is in front, that looks good for me. So I can, let me just increase it a little. All right. So I select this again. I'm going to go through the same process and do a minus front. Now I have cut this top part and I've also cut my circle at the top here. So now this is looking good. The next thing is I want to add this, this um, stem of the G in here. And I can see that I can, with, if I just simply add a rectangle, I should be good. So I make another copy of my rectangle here and I drag it up here and then I reduce it. So at this point, I think I'll zoom in a little so that I'm a little more precise and then I can move it in there. Um, let's zoom out to be sure the stem looks good. So let me increase this a little. I think it should be. All right, so that looks just about fine. And then I select both shapes again. But this time, instead of doing a minus front, all I just need to do is a unite. So I just unite them together. And now I have my G. It's looking good. It's looking like the Google logo. The next thing now is I want to break this G into different grid so that I can paint them differently. Same thing, I'll still be using my rectangles. I make a copy of the rectangle here and then I bring it somewhere here 
and then I can use my rotate tool again, which is my R, and rotate tool. So I'm keeping my eye up there on the on the top to be sure that it's looking just like the one I have there. Now just let me just move this a little. Alright, so that kind of looks good. That looks similar to it. And then finally I now want to do the cutout which is the boundary between my green and my blue down here. So I can just make another copy. Let me reduce that a little. Make it a little wider. And then I drag it up here. I click my R so that I can rotate. And then I drag it my V so that I can move it down. I think I should rotate it a little more. All right, so that about looks good. Now I'm ready to do a shape building. So I come to my selection tool, I select my three shapes now, and then I click on my shape builder. So with my shape builder, I'm only going to click on the parts of the intersections that I need. And at the moment, all I need is one, two, three, and four. So that will be all. Now I can delete all the extra parts. So this is an extra part. I don't need this. Delete this. This is also an extra part. I delete it. And then there's this tiny piece here. I delete it. So looking at this, it looks like a single solid G, but it's actually a G in four different parts. So I can now go ahead and paint them the correct colors. So the first up there is going to be red. And then next here is going to be yellow. Then followed by here, which is going to be green. And then finally, I have this stem here um, as a blue. So that is a simple way to reproduce the Google logo. It's not perfect, but then you get the entire idea. Now you can go ahead and reproduce yours. One of the key features that separates professionals um, is the fact that they are very concerned with organizing their work. And so we're going to be learning about how to ensure that your work is organized. Now, organization is important for two things. First is that there are times when you will actually do a design and um, you're not coming back to that design until two, three years afterwards or like long periods of times anyway. And you want to be able to come back to your design and have an understanding of how things are actually arranged, okay? So that's very, that's important. You, you, the times when you, you, you yourself need to come back to your work and understand it. And also, there are times when you have to share your work with other people so that they are also able to quickly understand how the elements are, are arranged in your illustration. That's why organizing is very important so we're going to we're going to be organizing using the layers panel you can access that by just going to the layer to layer here you can do, or you can just press f7 i already have it here uh, but because we're going to be working with it a lot i'll just drag the layer panel up to this place all right so here we can see our entire um all the objects in in our in our current illustration and one thing that it does is that it actually tells you what all the different elements are so i'm going to open this up a little more all right so that i can see it better so i can see these are parts these are groups um there's another group so you can you can see the name of the of the of um what type of element it is from here and one way you can one easy way of selecting is that i can just click on this circle here once I select it, you can see in here, I, my, my objects are selected. So let's say I wanted to group all these items together into one single item. I, from the selection tools that we had learned earlier, 
let me just use the lasso that seems like to be like the easiest i can use right now i just draw my lasso around it and now it's been selected and then you'll notice that whenever all the items are selected here they get a red rectangle in front of them so this confirms to me that these are all this all these items are selected and they all belong to this particular group here so i can just group all of them together i can right click and group so when i do that you can see here you can see the group right there in case it's a it's a longer list and it's a little difficult for you to figure it out you can just simply click this search item here it says locate object so once you locate object it's just going to open it up and then you can it's, it's going to select the very first object in the group for you and you'll be able to see where the group is so I, and then you can also rename this group so let's say uh, this i this is a surprised i surprised emoji so i'm just going to type surprise emoji here and then so that's that so with that i've already grouped my surprise emoji and that's good so i can just i can do the same thing for my other icons i go to my lasso tool i select around it and then you can see in here it has located all the different elements for me i right click group and i can see that the group here because of this small red icon here and then i can double click and say love i love eyes emoji and then i can do the same thing for my angry so i think this will call this the angry emoji so i right click and i group and i call it the angry emoji so with that you can see how i've been able to organize my different objects together you can see this is my rectangle here which is the which is the cyan background that you can see here okay um now one thing is they are all in this particular layer so i can tick this out so I can take, I can drag this out here. So, so we can see they're all in this layer. So let's say I want to take out this rectangle and put it on a different layer. I, what I can just do, I can just come create a new layer and then I open this up. I select, so I select this new, I've selected my new layer. I've selected my item here. I've created my new layer. I go, I select my item here. And then I go to edit and I cut. So when I cut, it goes out of it because it's no longer there. And then I click on the new layer here and I go back to my edit and I paste in front. Now I don't just do a normal paste. I would rather just do a paste in front and there's a reason for that. So when I paste in front, it's now put my sign background inside of this layer here and then i can reorder now because this is in front of my object but i need it behind i can simply drag this layer down okay and then i can rename it um, let's say cyan background enter and then with that we have a very neat layering so for my object here so let me let me rename my object um collection of emojis you can really use any name as long as some um, it's it's easy for you to understand it um you're fine there's the visibility toggle here which i can click on to either to hide or show my different elements and that's that's it for the for layering and grouping now let's assume i want to edit a particular um, part of this there's a feature in illustrator called the isolation mode so is what isolation does is it allows you to just enter a particular item and be able to edit it so when i what i can do is i can double click when i double click on this item if you'll notice you'll see that these other ones are a little grayed out and then another way you can know is that it has now put the particular arrangement up here so this collection of emojis remember this is my that was my that was the layer name so there's the layer name here and then surprise emoji is the current 
isolated group. So I can just I can just work on all these different items. So now we can see this, my eyes here are also grouped in here. And what I can do is I can double click on the eyes again. And I, now I have gone deeper into my isolation mode. So now I am in the eye group inside the surprise emoji group inside the collection of emojis layer. So that's how deep you can keep drilling. So let's, um, let me exit, double click, and then I come and rename this path as eyes. Okay. So when I go back there, double click, I've entered it once, double click again. So you can see eyes group inside the surprise emoji group inside the collection of emojis layer. And I can always do any work I want to do here. I can increase the size of the eyes. Let's make the eyes a little bigger. You can see, uh, now they're a little uneven, but um, it doesn't matter. And then I can come out. So you can see I've gone in, I've drilled in, I've been able to make an edit. Now this is, drilling is important because when you have a group like this, here's the problem with a group. When I move, every item in the group moves. But let's assume I wanted to move the eyes a little higher. When I'm in the, when I've grouped everything, I can't do that. So what I do is I double click to enter my isolation mode and then I can move the eyes up. So let's assume I also want, now you can see what it looks like now. Let's assume I also want to move one particular eye independent of the other. I go again, double click into my isolation mode. They've now become different. And then I can say, I want to drag this down. That looks pretty ugly but then you get the idea of what we're trying to achieve so let me move the eyebrow also so that you can appreciate it i'm just going to nudge it a little bit so this is the beauty of the isolation mode you can use it when you're really drilling down on your objects and your layers and your groups